Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Clintstone Chapter 19 Ode Written by some guy named Ted, the link to the original will be down below and as always, I hope that you enjoy. In Clint's mind, there was a concept of repayment. If you do something for him, he will do something for you. But, because he is Clint, his idea of repayment is that he owes you much more than you gave him. Should you owe him kindness, he will show you back threefold. Should you show him anger or violence, he will give it back sevenfold. Should you hurt one who showed Clint kindness, he will pay it tenfold. We were on the frontier planet Fasan, I believe it was. We had come into a part of information on the Swan, and it was a week after Clint had gotten his new arm and he was already chomping at the bit. I was too. Back in Baruna, after the guild, we had decided that we were going to do as much damage to the Swern Empire as we could. Flint and I had made it our mission to bring justice to the galaxy. That was before he lost his arm. Now, I think that the new arm gave him a notion that he was going to start a one-man war against the Empire. Well, two man, there was no way I was going to go let him have all the fun. The rain came down with a heavy drizzle, coating everything in sight. It had been coming down for hours, and I was thoroughly soaked. My fur did not help in cases like this, and I could feel the moisture gathering on my skin. When I got inside, I would be able to quickly wick the water away, but out here in the drizzle, there would be no point. Water dripped incessantly from the fur above my eyes, blinding me. I took my head to clear my eyes of water, and I stopped dripping for a few seconds and then resumed with vigor. The drizzle had turned into a downpour. Lucky the wall of the shipyard was ahead. Past that there was a waiting Susan, the warm blankets and dry air. Clint and I walked side by side into the dry tunnel leading to the shipyard. I shook myself and water flew from around the tunnel. Clint spluttered as water hit him in the face. I gave him an apologetic look and he kept walking. The tunnel ended abruptly several dozen feet from where it should have. Set across the width of the tunnel was a long barricade, manned by quite a few mean-looking watchmen. Halt! One of them commanded from the watchman in the middle, his hand resting on his rifle strapped across his chest. We stopped. What is your business here? He demanded. Our ship is in there. Clint nodded his head down the tunnel, and we'd rather like to get back to it. The watchman shook his head. That's too bad. You'll have to wait several days. What? I shouted. Why? There is a security threat. That is all I am authorized to say and all I'm going to say. I advise that you turn around and go back the way you came. I was wet. I was tired. And this arrogant, tentacled head hearth was telling me that I would have to go back into the rain. I almost felt water evaporating from my skin as it heated with anger. I felt a hand on my arm, a warm and hard. I looked up and Clint shook his head. He pulled me away from the barrier and back into the rain. There was only one inn in the small town and it was already full. By this time, I had given up on the hope that I would ever be dry again, and Clint and I sat under the awning of one of the storefronts. It did provide shelter from the rain, but not from the cold air. I was miserable. Clint seemed better off, his fur of skin was already dry, and he only had one hand to feel the cold. We sat there for a while, watching the rain fall. Down the street came a figure, splashing in puddles and struggling under the weight of a large package clutched awkwardly in his hands. He slipped in the mud and fell, his package rolling several feet. Clint jumped up off the porch and into the mud, helping the being to his feet. When Clint had been sure the thing was on his feet, Clint picked up the package lying in the mud. I could see that the being was an elderly heist. Its tentacles weathered with age. His posture was stooped, but even standing tall, he would have been over a foot below Clint. The hearth seemed bowed by some great weight, but it was not the weight of age. He seemed worried. My thanks, stranger. My old bones aren't like what they used to be. The high thanked Clint. He sucked in a deep breath, and he motioned to the package that Clint held in the crook of his arms. I'll take that now. I can carry it if you want, Clint said. The hearth blinked. I thank you for the offer, but I can manage. The statement was weakened off by the fit of coughing. 
He bent over at the waist, hands and knees, coughing violently. I was half afraid that he would hack up his lungs into the street. When the fit had subsided, Clint put his hand on the old being's shoulder. I'm sure you can, but I will carry it for you anyway. The being looked up. I have nothing to pay you with. I did not ask for payment. I cut in, jumping up from the porch in the street. Perhaps a roof over our heads at a warm meal would not go amiss. The old being smiled. That I can give you. Follow me. We followed the old hearth through the rain and the mud, plodding down side street after side street, deep into the center of the town. The trip was silent except for the sound of the rain and the splash of the puddles and a squelch of the mud. The being told us his name was Merkel, and that was all that was said. We stopped with a run-down house, not much better than a hovel, but it was warm and it was dry. We went in with our complaint. It was bigger on the inside, but not by much. We stood in what was a living room, judging by the couch and pictures on the wall. A wall separated this room from the next, interrupting only by a door frame set in the far left, which, from the smells coming from it, led to a kitchen. My stomach growled and my skin luxuriated in the warm air. Merkel motioned for Clint to set down the heavy package near the couch. Murder, I brought guests home, and the big one is, uh, you know, I don't quite know your names, said Merkel, his voice quiet and leathery. Clint, Clint said, and this is TEDx. The big one is Clint and the furry one is TEDx. The little hearth girl ran around the corner into Merkel's arms. She must have been around five or six years old. Merkel lifted her up in his arms and hugged her. And this is Haig. It was obvious that Haig was not Merkel's daughter. She was too young and he was too old. Most likely a granddaughter. She looked at Clint and I with a fearless look and a very young person would have. Bold and curious. She noticed Clint's metal hand and pointed at it. Why is your hand all funny? She asked in a high-pitched voice. Clint raised his hand. What? This thing? I touched a space unicorn and my hand turned silver. She giggled. Clint always had a way with children. With his enemies, he was as hard and unflinching as a mountain. But with children, he seemed to melt, showing his soft inside. He held out his hand in palm up and in front of the little girl that she tapped her finger on it, and it made a faint ping as she giggled again. Merkel looked up at Clint. It's been a long time since I heard her laugh. It seems I must thank you again. Clint shrugged and seemed bashful. A bright woman walked around the wall, wiping her hands on a dish towel. She was about the same age as Merkel, and I assumed she was his wife. She was smiling at the sound of Haig's laughter. It's been a long time. What might you be doing here out so far from the rest of things? We came here for some business. Something happened at the shipyards and we're struck here for several days. Your husband was kind enough to offer us a roof and some food for the night, I said. Yes, he's always been a rather soft-hearted. I think that's why I married him, she said, her voice full of love and kindness. It made my heart ache for my wife, well, ex-wife, and the divorce hadn't been pretty, but I still thought about her on occasion and my heart still hurt. Oh, where are my manners? Come on, come on. Put your coats on and boots by the door and come sit down at the table. We're having brief. Translation note, not actually cow meat, but close enough for this purpose. Stew and fresh baked bread. We thank you very much for your hospitality, Clint said, pulling off his coat. I think that we would have been out in the storm all night. We're grateful for the warmth and shelter. I heard a gasp, and I turned my head to see Merkel standing with his mouth open, staring at Clint's arm, which, now that he had removed his cloak, was full of visible with his metallic glory. It's... it's made of metal. I just thought that it was a glove or something. But your arm is made of metal. Clint Grimston half turned to the side, trying to hide his arm from view. Merkel looked embarrassed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. I'm just surprised me, that's all. Clint grunted. Well, I think it's cool, the little girl said. Clint smiled. Why don't we all eat, said Myrta, and she looked at Merkel and Clint and I. After you wash up. We nodded in agreement as we shuffled into the washroom. I was the last out, as I had the most fur to clean. 
When I'd emerged, I felt like a different Jahan, dry and clean, and I felt refreshed. The smells of the bread and the stew filled my nose as I walked into the kitchen and sat at one of the chairs around the table. It was made for smaller beings than Clint, and we sat hunched over in his chair, getting as close to the table as possible. I sat down, and we ate. The bread was the best I had ever tasted, and the stew was not far off. The conversation started off slow at first, but soon picked up pace and we found ourselves laughing at jokes of Merkel and nodding at the observations of Murta. Haig entertained us with thrilling tales of adventure of her life at school and the playground. Clint told stories of his exploits, much edited for the little ears, and I awed them with my juggling. It seems that the Hrys do not have the coordination for it, and so they'd never seen it before. All the while, I was working on steaming bowl of stew and half a loaf of bread in front of me. Soon, I found myself chasing the last remnants of the broth around my plate with a slice of bread. I popped that in my mouth and savoured it. Travelling on Susan, it had been a great while since Clint and I had eaten home-cooked meal. The conversation continued after the meal for a long while. Clint paid special attention to Haig, making her giggle and giggle with increasingly wild tales some about a girl who fell down a rabbit hole and others about a boy who never grew up. I thought that they were ridiculous tales, but Haig seemed to love them. I have no idea where Clint had heard them from before, but they seemed to be from his childhood. Clint Stone was full of surprises. He would never speak to his past to anyone, but here he was sharing stories with a child. They always seemed to bring out the best in Clint. We talked for several more hours, Clint and I so rarely got the chance for more than a few minutes of conversation with anyone other than each other. We soaked up the talk like a parched earth under the rainstorm. Merkel and Murta seemed to need conversation as much as we did, and so our talks went on for a great while. Haig's head started to nod and Murta took her off to bed, leaving Clint and I to talk with Merkel. Where are her parents? I asked. Without thinking, I should have realized that it would be a bad question to ask. Merkel, who was talking with Clint about the merits of high-raised deviant foil, fell silent and sad. I saw the worry that had been on him when we first met him, and that had lessened when he got here, dropped back on him like the weight of a house. I'm sorry, I said, I shouldn't have asked that. It was rude of me. His hand waved off. It's all right. I just haven't thought about them in a very long time. They lied. When Haig was three, but she was saw the whole thing. She had been such a happy child, always laughing and giggling. She stopped laughing after that. And now you came and you made her laugh again. It makes my old hearts warm. It seems I owe much to you, more than a roof and a hot meal. You owe us nothing, Glenn said, and I nodded in agreement. We owe you much more, I said. You gave us a good food, a conversation that travelers like ourselves rarely get. Merkel blew air through his nostrils. We sat in quiet for a moment, trying to think of something to say. Murta chose that moment to return. I've set up some beds for you in the room down the hall, she said, not noticing the silence, or choosing to ignore it. We set off for the room and we collapsed on the beds. My bed was lumpy and had a strange tilt to it. Clint's bed was far too small for him, and we were asleep in moments. I awoke in the middle of the night, my bladder screaming at me. I stood up and made my way carefully down the hall to the washroom, not wanting to disturb anyone. I relieved myself and wandered back to my room. As I passed our host's door, I could hear the sounds of hushed whispers. Being the curious being that I am, I stood there, straining to hear what was being said. I could only catch bits and pieces of the conversation. They said tomorrow. Well, we have nothing. We can't afford. They said, sell her. Slave markets. Someone moved close to the door and I nearly jumped, but that would have given me away. I settled for a beating heart and hurried to return to my bed. The next morning, Clint and I awoke to the sound of water running in the washroom. We both climbed out of our beds and walked down the hall to the smell of pancakes. If you said one thing about Myrta, it was that she knew how to cook. We sat down and devoured the large stack of food placed in front of us. Clint tried to start a conversation, but this morning was a very different from last night. The mood was dark and worried. I could see it on the faces of Merkel and Myrta. 
Whatever they had been discussing last night must have been grim indeed. Haig did not seem to notice, and she and Clint continued in much the same way they had last night. He soon had a giggling and laughing, Clint chuckling along with her. The sight was enough to give me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Clint was a man full of pain and loss and anger, but when he was around a child, he was a different man. I'd seen it when he had met Rogan, and I'd seen all the terrible things that had happened after that had been ripped away from him. I wasn't sure that Clint could survive another event like that. All the galaxy. After the hollow Clint had his vengeance. The breakfast was over quickly, and I jumped up to help Murta with the dishes. She protested, but I insisted. It was the least that I could do for what they had given us. I was elbows deep in the soapy water when a knock came at the door. It was more of a banging, pounding than a knock. I stopped what I was doing and tried my hands on the dish rag. Merkel stood up. Stay here, he said to Clint and me. He walked out of the line of sight and view and I heard him open up the door. How may I? started Merkel, his voice quavering. Cut the crap, you old squid. Here for the money and you're gonna pay up, he said in a voice that was rough and hard. The type of voice that belonged to someone who was used to getting what they wanted. I'm sorry, I don't have it. Times have been... I don't give a crap about your excuses, old man. I just give me the money. I'll have it to take something that's worth what you owe me. We have nothing. Everything of value I already sold before. There's still the little girl. We can sell her to the slave market. She'll fetch a fine price. But not after we get our uses out of her. A truly disgusting chuckle followed that statement. I looked at Clint and nearly shrunk back in horror. His face put the thunder to shame. He stood and started to walk towards the door. I put my hand on his arm and stopped him. Wait for a moment. If he leaves, that's the end of it. If he stays, I'll help you take care of him. Clint thought for a moment and then nodded his head. But I knew the hard voice wouldn't leave. Truth be told, I was ready to sink a knife into him myself. No, please, I beg you, not her. Merkel's voice was pitiful and full of sorrow. It did not seem to affect the hard voice. Get out of my way. There was the sound of a body falling against the wall, heavy footsteps sounding in the living room, and he walked into the kitchen door. Into the kitchen stepped a large being with an indistinguishable race, clutching a large plasma rifle in his hand. Indistinguishable because his face was covered with so many modifications and tattoos that I could barely tell what the being had a face. He stopped when he saw Clint standing there, but in a tiny mind he dismissed Clint as a threat because he had a pistol and Clint was unarmed. He saw Haig standing behind Clint, hiding behind him actually, grabbing his leg for support. The thug's eyes lit up and he walked forward. Clint put up his hand. Not a step further. Clint's voice was low and menacing. He would be halfway to the next planet by now. But he didn't and he saw this as a challenge to his authority. Get out of the way, stranger. I'm here for the little girl. I don't think so. The thug stared stupidly at Clint, his mouth hanging open. He couldn't comprehend the fact that someone would stand up to him. He tried to shove past Clint. Clint grabbed him by the throat and shoved him against the wall, shaking the house from the force. The only reason I don't kill you right now is because I do not wish to cause undue trauma to the little girl. He hissed. His eyes blazing, the being struggled to free himself. He raised a pistol, but Clint grabbed her with his other hand, the metal hand, and squeezed. The thug gave a screech of pain and dropped the gun. We are going outside, and we are going to have a nice little chat. Should you try anything before we leave this house, I will twist your head so far around that you will be staring at your own rear. The thug nodded in understanding, and Clint pushed him out the door. We passed Merkel, who was seated on the couch, gaping at Clint, manhandling the thug without trouble. He flung him out the doorway and sent him crashing into a group of similarly modified tattooed beings. Clint stepped down from the stoop and stood, legs apart, knees flexed, before the group. I followed him, the butcher's knife clutched into one hand and a carving knife in the other. I had taken them from the kitchen as we walked out. I see you have friends, Clint said. Good. That makes things more interesting. Now that the thug was back amongst his home, he had regained his smug, arrogant attitude. 
You dare to scare us, you pink bastard. We'll carve you to pieces. He nodded at Clint's metal arm, which he clearly thought was just some sort of glove. Then we'll sell the leftovers. You're not scared. You should be. Do you know who I am, what I've done? I am Clint Stone, the slayer of dragons, killer of thieves, liberator of slaves. I killed Doinf Gang. I slaughtered the thieves, killed and Baruna. I once scared an entire race so badly that they left the galaxy rather than face me. You should be scared, boy. You should be very scared. Clint was angry. The terrible anger that he had when innocents were threatened. And there was no one more innocent than children. I was angry too. The knives in my hand would soon drink blood. Lead Thug shouted back. You don't give a crap about what you've said you've done. All I can see is two unarmed and we're outnumber you eight to one. You could love you through this, Pinky, but no, I'm gonna have to kill you on principle. Can't have people going around thinking that they can do whatever they like. Bad for business. You gonna talk all day, or are we gonna fight? I asked him calmly. Clint looked at me, grinning with approval. Several of the thugs shouted as they ran at us, knives in their hands. Two of them, big and mean-looking, a pair of them. A few months ago, I would have run in the opposite direction. Now, I stepped forward to meet them, knives held at the ready. One of the thugs went for Clint other than me. Clint strode forward to meet him with the middle. He pulled back his left hand, the metal one, and swung it at the thug's chest. It punched straight through and I could see the hand sticking out the back, covered in gore. The thug's eyes bulged as his collapsed, sliding off Clint's arm. The thug in front of me glanced in shock at Clint and I took advantage of the distraction. I swept a carving knife across the thug's neck, severing his windpipe. He looked at me in shock as thin red lines opened up on his neck. He fell to his knees and then his face. I stepped over him and stood beside Clint. Anyone else? I called. The rest of the thug stepped forward in a roar. Clint and I stepped into the middle of them and danced, he with his fists of steel and stone and I with my knives. The nearest thug made a wild swing at me and I ducked underneath it, plunging my knife deep into his chest. I ripped it out and then swung at the next thug. This one was smarter and stayed back, testing my defenses. A body flew over my head, an arm missing, and crashed into him, knocking him to the ground. I made short work of him. The rest of the thugs were no better. I was almost disappointed. I killed them with my knives and Clint destroyed them with his fists. They lasted no longer than several minutes until all that remained was the first thug, the ringleader. The rest of them lay in the streets, each in a different state of death. Several had their head caved in, one so far that all that was left was a bit of brain and spine. Others had died in crushed ribs and shattered necks. Here and there bodies lay with gaping wounds and stab holes. My work. Clint walked towards the last thug. He stumbled backwards in horror, his eyes wide. He spit twisting an arm of one of the thugs and he fell and stood over Clint. Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. I have a very special job for you. Clint paused to make sure that the thug was listening to him. He was... I want you to tell everyone what happened here today. I want you to get to a ship and fly to the core worlds of Swarm. You will shout it from the rooftops. You will tell them the tale of Clint Stone. Tell them that I am coming for them. The thug nodded, his face full of fear. He shakily stood. Clint looked at him, but just to make sure that you never bother this family again. Clint's metal hand flashed out and a single blue blade erupting from his finger. The thug screamed and his arm fell to the dirt, smoking, coating from the edges. Now go, before I'm tempted to take the rest. The thug took off as fast as his legs would carry him, clutching his stump and crying. I turned to Glint. That was very nicely done. Violence is never nicely done. It is necessary sometimes, but it is not a thing to revel in. He sighed. We must be out of here before the watch shows up. I agreed, and we turned to walk away. Wait! Came Merkel's voice behind us. Wait, I must thank you. I can never repay you for what you've done. But I would like to give you my thanks, Clint grunted. You do not need to thank me. I did not do it for you. Clint jerked his head at the house behind Merkel. I did it for her. Here, 
I have something for you. He dug at his coat pocket and pushed something into Merkel's hand. He opened it, curious at what Clint had given him, and his jaw dropped. This is enough gold for us to live wealthy for the rest of our lives, he said incredulous. This is too much, I cannot take it. He held his hand out to Clint. Take it back. Clint reached out and closed the Wright's hand around the gold. Take it. Take it and use it for the better life for Haig. She deserves it. Merkel nodded. I will. Thank you, thank you. This is beyond anything I deserve. You don't deserve it, Clint said. Merkel looked at him, confusion in his eyes. But she does. I will be back here some day, and I hope to find a happy Haig. With that, he turned and strode away, and I followed. The shipyard was not difficult to scale, and we quietly stole into the yard and got into Susan. We flew off before anyone knew that we were there. We flew off into the galaxy seeking the first target in our two-man war against the Swarm Empire. End of chapter I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please consider subscribing. If you wish to support the author, there is a link to the original story, so pop over there and give him your support. If you wish to support this channel, however, there are a few ways to do so. The best and easiest would be to share this video with other people, as well as liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All of these things tell the algorithm that this channel is at least vaguely interesting, and that you may share it with other people. If you wish to support the channel in some other manner, watching my other videos would also help tremendously. Or, if you really, really, really like, there is a link down below to leave a tip or to join the Patreon. Any and all support is very much appreciated. And I hope that you all have a good one until the next time. And I'll see you then. Cheers.